what Christ can do, but I want to build a name that won't fail at the time when I need it the most. So I told you, I said that we got to take responsibility for this name. We got to identify the character flaws that are attached to this name, and we've got to fix them. We've got to use the word of God to become men of unfailing character. We've got to make sure that who we are is one, is in a working relationship with the Father and the Son. And, and so in my part, I was giving you a list of seven things. I gave you four. I still got three to give you. I want to go through them real quickly. I said, first of all, if you're going to develop unfailing character, you have to be born again. Not, not just have come to the altar, but you've got to acknowledge that your old life failed and accept that you need a new life. You've got to acknowledge that your old life failed. You know, when I, was in, when I was in high school, if I failed something, if I got a failing grade, I didn't keep that grade on the wall. I didn't stick it on the refrigerator. Come on now. I, I, I didn't keep it in my binder. You know, one, one, once my parents, you know, had to, they, they had to sign off on it. But as soon as that was over, that boy got ripped up, thrown away. Why? Because I, I didn't want to keep failing things around me. If I'm born again, why I still got failed things from my failed life in my life? Got to get rid of that stuff. Then we said we have to learn the word of God. And we learn it through instruction, observation, and repetition. In other words, we learn it, Pastor Branson, by getting under authority. Somebody who can give me some good instruction. Somebody that I can observe. I can watch. I can mark them. Paul said in the same chapter where he counted all those things but lost, he said mark those who you have as an example. Put a mark on them. Know who you're watching. Then just repeat after them. My Lord. What did he do? I'm doing that. Listen, in the early days of my ministry, before I would leave the house, I would call down to my father. What you wearing tonight? That's what I'm wearing. Now, well, it wasn't, but it is now. What do you have on? Well, I'm wearing this. I'm going to change. I'm wearing that too. Why? I'm trying to get some character. It may or may not be in these clothes, but I don't have it yet. <laughs> so <laughs> just try changing. <laughs> I don't have character in the outfit I got on. He got character. Let's try a new outfit. <laughs> then we said we have to come out of the world. And guess what? Every message has been telling you to come out of the world. Everybody has been trying to tell you, come out of the world. And, and then fourthly, the fourth thing we have to do is we have to renew our mind. We have to renew our mind. Now, I want to give you four quick things to help you to renew your mind. If you're going to renew your mind, first of all, you have to meditate on the word of God. That, that's that organized thought life. You have to meditate on the word of God. Now, meditating is not just, um, think about it. You should leave this mountain thinking about, listen, most of us don't have nine hours of travel time. So you got more to think about than you have time to even think about it on the way home. Just think about it. He said, I'll keep you in perfect peace if you just keep your mind stayed on me. Just think about it. Just think about what you heard. Just think about it. You don't have to think about all of it. Just take one thing. Amen. Pastor Brent says, shine my shoes. If you don't clean your shoes, there are other things you won't clean. I want to be clean. I want to be clean. God, I want to be clean. You know what God's going to start doing? Say, clean this, clean that, clean this, clean that. Just think on it. That's how you renew your mind. You have to med You can't just, you know, say, uh, I'm still struggling. Well, what are you thinking about? See, the great thing about thoughts is you get to decide what you think about. Just because a thought comes in your mind doesn't mean you have to sit up all night and think on the thought. So I got to meditate, but then I got to crucify ungodly thoughts. 2 Corinthians 5 says, bring every thought under captivity to the word of God and make it obey. You got to bring those thoughts. Every time I have a thought that doesn't glorify God, I got to do something with it. I've got to bring it under captivity. In other words, a thought is like a crazy man. 
if you don't wrestle it down, it's going it's to go crazy in your head. You got to tackle it. You know, we've been using football. You got to tackle it. I'm not talking about, no, you know, you know, grabbing it by the jersey and, you know, letting it drag you around. You got to nail that joker. You got to he, drop your head, stick your shoulder in it, and pin it. Now, I'm not dealing with that. There's sometimes I even have to say out loud, my, we ain't thinking like that today. No, hey, cut that mess out. Don't mess with me. I'm a man of God. You better get yourself together. You can't let yourself just sit up and think about things that aren't wholesome and good for you, contrary to what you've been taught. You got to crucify them thoughts. You got to nail those thoughts. So then you, you meditate, you crucify, but then you got to deny your mind ungodly thoughts and ungodliness. See, if I feed my mind ungodliness, it's going to make it harder for me to uh, to think on the things of God because my mind, see your mind, watch this, your mind does not work off what it knows. Your mind works off of what it uses the most and what it last received. Now you need to write that down. Your mind does not work on what it knows. It works on what it uses the most and what it last received. That's why when you go to a studies class, they tell you, do not cram for the exam. Because if you cram for the exam, when you get in the exam, the only thing your mind is going to pull up is the last thing you looked at. And all that other stuff you studied all week, poop, gone. It's in there somewhere, but your mind said, well, I thought we were only using the last thing you gave me. He said, no, I was studying all week, mind. Say, well... I just assumed that the last 15 minutes when you were all full of anxiety cramming that in there. See? So I, I've got to, I can't pump my mind. I can't look at ungodliness Monday through Saturday, show up at church on Sunday, doze through a one-hour message, and ask why I'm still weak. How many hours of filth does your mind get versus how many hours of righteousness does your mind get? And I guarantee you, when you find the answer, you're also going to find your character. You're going to find your character. See, your character is a reflection of your diet, your mental diet. So I, I've got to change my mental diet. See, ungodliness is like sugar to cancer. When a person gets cancer, the first thing they say is, stop eating sugar. Because cancer loves sugar. Cancer gets sugar, it's like party time. It metastasizes through your whole body. So they say, stop the sugar. But here's the thing. Sugar comes in more form than just a candy bar. Amen. Candy bars are absolute sugar. But sugar is also found in something that you like to eat called bread. Amen. Bread turns into sugar. See, so watch this. Some of us have dropped the candy, but we still got the bread. We've dropped the hardcore stuff, but we still got the soft stuff that converts over. We, we, we didn't drop the porn, but we still got the R, the bread. Come on now. We, we, we didn't drop the go-go in the club, but we still got the smooth jazz, the bread. <laughs> we on a, we on a bread diet, and we think we all right because we gave up the hardcore sugar. See, we, 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 we didn't gave up the cheating, but we still got the bread of looking. Amen. All right, then we got, after we deny, then we got to edify our mind with the truth of God's word. See, you just can't starve your brain. You got to feed it the right thing. And some, some of us were struggling because we have starved it from unrighteousness, but we're not feeding it with the truth of God's word. And the brain has to be fed. It has to be fed. So when I'm denying it ungodliness, I got to now edify it, strengthen it with the truth. That's why we study to show ourselves approved unto God, a workman that needs not be ashamed. Fifth thing. And boy, this has been well covered, so I can just say it and move on. We have to develop a consistent, godly lifestyle. 
Discipline your life. Put it on a schedule. Pastor Branson, while you were teaching, God told me to tell the men this. If you're struggling with a habit, a, a, an addiction, or a behavior, treat yourself like a child. If you're struggling with a habit, an addiction, or a behavior, treat yourself like a child. What do I mean by that? Children, you monitor everything they do, and you don't let them get away with nothing. Treat yourself like a child. See, if you're struggling with an addiction, a behavior, or a pattern that's ungodly, and you're married, when you get ready to leave the house, call your wife. Say, baby, I'm leaving. I'm on my way to work. It takes me 20 minutes to get there. Halfway through, call and say, I'm halfway there. I'll call you when I arrive. When you get there, say, baby, I'm at work. I go to lunch at 12. At 12, call and say, I'm on my way to lunch. I'm going to get a salad. It takes me 20 minutes to go down to the curb and get back. I'll call you when I Treat yourself like a child. Treat yourself like a child. If you're struggling, give all your money to somebody else. Say, just give me please an allowance. Because you can't get much a high off of $3 a day. See? See, give me $1 because I like to go to the soda machine. Now, you go down the corner with $1, you ain't getting much. Treat yourself like a child. So the man come by and say, you want something? Say, oh, I didn't treat myself like a child. I don't have any money. If you, can, if you can't stop spending, treat yourself like a child. Cut up all your credit cards, cut up your ATM card, get rid of that. Treat yourself like a child. I learned something. If I have no means of spending money, I can't. See? If I have no means of spending money, if I have no means of spending money, if I leave all the means for spending money at home, no matter how bad my flesh wants to, I can't. Then next, sixth thing, is we have to learn to endure. We have to learn to endure. Everybody say endure. endure. You have to learn to endure. Let me give you a, a nice illumination. Uh, pastors and preachers don't get less temptation than anybody else. You know, this is like this perception of somehow that, you know, well, you're a pastor. Well, what does that mean? <laughs> Only women with ugly faces and no breasts come up and talk to me? <laughs> I mean, you know, what, what is, I don't understand what being a, what, what does a pastor have to do with temptation? <laughs> we, we, we don't get, if, if, it, <laughs> if anything, we get more temptation. Because people trust us with their lives and don't ask us what we're doing. Amen. People don't ask us what. Uh, somebody see a preacher doing something shaky, they just say, oh, well, I, I know they ain't doing that. Amen. See, if you saw me talking to a young lady at the altar after church, you, you say, oh, I know pastor. He ain't. See, so I only had, I only had no police. Amen. Some of y'all send your wives up to talk to me. Go talk to pastor. You just sit up there. Go talk to pastor. He don't have temptation. Go talk to him. Sure. Every other brother in the church you like. They come up to see me. You're like, where your wife? Oh, she up there with him. <laughs> we have temptation just like everybody else. What we've learned is to endure. Temptation doesn't go away. Somebody, somebody said, uh, some, some of y'all saying, I don't feel like I'm growing because I'm still being tempted. Are you still sinning? No, I'm resisting. You're growing. <laughs> <laughs> you, you're growing. That's all the growth you get. You used to sin. <laughs> How much more grown you want to be? You used to get tempted in sin. Now you're tempted and you don't. You are a mature man in Christ. <laughs> that, that's the definition. <laughs> what, what else do you want? <laughs> See? See, the, the women didn't disappear away from the pool. He just closed the curtains. He's a mature man in Christ. 
What y'all thought, the mature man in Christ? I don't even see those women down there. <laughs> Glory be to God. <laughs> ha hallelujah. Sister Branson, we're, we're in Puerto Rico, and, and to me, everyone has on full-length coats. <laughs> Listen, Jack, read James 1 on your own time. It, it, it says that, 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 that count it all joy when you fall into diverse temptations, knowing that the trying of your faith is going to work patience, and let patience have its perfect work until you are complete and entire wanting nothing. You don't get complete and entire and wanting nothing because you get a break from temptation. You become complete and entire and wanting nothing because when you were tempted, you stuck your shoulders back, lifted up your head and said, I will not yield to temptation. And it starts to perfect you down on the inside. Each time you resist temptation, you get stronger. Your character starts to get developed. And all of a sudden, your, your, your flesh starts to believe that you won't fall. Say, this fool here, I, we didn't, the devil didn't brought everything by. He won't do nothing. <laughs> After a while, your flesh goes, oh, no, please. Who, who am I kidding? <laughs> I know who my owner is. We ain't going for it, are we? No. I knew it. <laughs> Flesh just say, but you know, I just got to check with you, though. <laughs> Your flesh in every conversation like this, i see you tomorrow. <laughs> you, say, you say, I'm not sinning. I'm not doing it. Your flesh say, I, oh, okay. i see you tomorrow. <laughs> That's my interpretation of when I would do good. Evil is always present with me. <laughs> Amen. When I take the role, it's me, myself, and I, and evil. Evil ain't never gone on vacation. You know, I say, evil has never said, two-week holiday. I'm going to leave you alone. You won't have to worry about it. You know, I'm going to the beach. For the next two weeks, you can live holy on automatic. Evil would wake up every morning and say, you ready to go? <laughs> Let's go. I just got to endure. But watch this. All six of those things and all eight hours of teaching that you heard up to this week that are contained in those six things can't be accomplished if I don't get number seven. The seventh thing I have to do is I have to be led by the Spirit. I have to be led by the Spirit. That means I have to have the Spirit down on the inside. Because you can't be led by somebody that is not there to lead. Come on. Now, I believe that, there, that, that most people in church, the overwhelming majority of people in church, are born of God's spirit. They're born again. Not everybody in church is born again. Y'all know that, right? Okay. That would make temptation easier, too, if everybody...